do you know where that guy lives? The guy that did the stick in, and he goes, yeah. I said, well, pick me up tonight, you know, at the hotel about 8 o'clock. And he goes, all right. And not because I, I knew he was wearing that. I Believe me, if I would have known that, I would have punched his lights out right there, you know, and tore it off of him. This episode of Chatting with Stacks, I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today I got Pee Wee. You're in San Francisco. Where do you go from there, and how long do you stay there, and was there any big events that happened in your life when this was happening, and did you go back to Minnesota, and what was it like when you went back to Minnesota? Believe this, bro. I went back to Minnesota when Pat got busted on, 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 his, uh, on his federal case. He gave him 20 years, and um, he had a going-away party. And I went to his going-away party, and I seen uh, there was, there was peop- all kinds of people. Other clubs were there. Uh, a club I love dearly, the Hell for Sterols. You know, they're big in the Midwest. They're a big, they're a big 1% club, you know, and they started way back in, uh, like, 62 – yeah, and those it. guys are still my friends to this day. You know, I, I love them. Uh, they're they're great. They're a true brotherhood, you know. And they were there. I see one of their members give Pat a nice, nice gold ring and, you know, say, hey, man, it's bad. This is happening to you. And we're all there hanging out with them. And Pat looks at me and he says, Charlie, can you forever forgive me for what I did to you? You know, running me down the road, but now I was a hell's angel, right? California one. And I said, well, you know, Pat, I already forgave you because they came to your uh, going away party. Uh, obviously, I'm not holding a grudge. Or I wouldn't have came, you know? And uh, I thought it was pretty funny. He says, hey, look. When we get done here, we'll stop by the clubhouse. You know, he said, I want to give you a, like each charter had a different uh, uh, death head. Not like the the original logo one you see on their backs. Yeah. The club, the, the charters would make up like a different one. Like Amsterdam had the one with the three X's in it. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. And Yeah, like a unique one for each place. Right, right. And like Orange County had one with a bandana on its head. A different shit. You know me being in uh, in, in San Francisco, I, I I don't think we really uh, had like a, a Frisco one. I, I don't remember uh, people that gave me death heads from like different charters. I, I wear a couple of those, and um, so Pat says, "Hey, you know what I want to do? I want to give you a Minnesota a Minnesota death head pin. You want one?" I said, "Sure." So he says, yeah, we go over to the clubhouse, uh, we'll get it. That's all right. So when the bar closed, we we all went over to the clubhouse, you know, he says, hey, come on, follow me. I'm going to go get you a pin. Walk in, he goes, hey, man, he opens his door, there's all these pins in there, and he goes, which one do you want? And I says, I don't know, you got a five-year one in there? And he looked at me, because, you you know, i only been in the club like a year and a half, two years, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know where I was going with that, right, bro? Yeah. You got a five-year one? Because I feel like I got fucked out of those five years. Yeah. That's how I felt. He laughed. He actually laughed. You know, he knew it was like funny, funny, ha-ha bullshit. But, yeah, he laughed. But he gave me a pin. Not a five-year pin, but he gave me a pin. And, uh, honestly, uh, I think he was already working with the police at that time. 
he was already making deals, you know. I can't prove it, but I think I, I think he he was. And because um, there was a situation where he asked me, "What did you do with your house? The house that I had that one I was telling you I I finished it up when I got done yeah. when I got kicked out. Yeah. Well, I sold it. I sold it to uh, this guy that everybody knew, and he. He couldn't go to a bank stacks and get a loan because he sold this, right? Yeah. The white stuff. And he was making tons of money on it. And he had tons of money, tons of cars, tons of motorcycles. He wanted to buy my house because it was out in the country, three acres, no neighbors, cornfields all around you. And uh, he's like, I, I want your house, man. He wants the privacy. And, um, he said, I can't get a loan. I can't get a loan to buy your house. He goes, how about I give you a big chunk of cash and then I, I'll make your house payments. That's kind of a dangerous thing, my friend, you know, because if he stops making house payments, I got to make them. But he gave me like 45000 in cash. And I would have 105000 The house was worth about, at that time, we're talking 1999. Yeah, 1999 yeah. when I moved, did the Frisco move. And then I, I said, yeah, give me forty-five in cash, and I owe hundred and five on on the house yet. That's what I owed, and uh, he gave me the cash. <laughs> We're on the floor, bro, counting fives, tens, twenties, fifties. Big stack of money. Yeah, yeah, you know how that goes. Yeah, I wish it would have been all hundred dollar bills, but it wasn't because it wasn't all bank transfers, you know. <laughs> so we counted up the money, we did it, and I told Pat that. And I said, he bought it and, and, you know, he's making the payments. And I'll be a son of a bitch if that wasn't in his paperwork, you know? Wow. Yeah. So what happened was that really, like, messed me up at the time was, you know, he was making the payments. You know, he made the payments. But damn stacks, he, he, he paid the house off in three years. And I didn't even have a job. So, you know, well, Wells Fargo calls me up after three years and go, congratulations, Mr. Goldsman. You just, you know. Oh, but it's out. still in your name, right? Right, because I told you I gave him my payment book. Oh, and he go, congratulations, man. you got 800 coming back on the escrow and uh, your house is paid off. So I call him and I go, man, what the hell are you doing? And he goes, I thought you'd be happy. I paid it off. And I go, God damn, bro. I'm not even working, man. They're going to try to figure out how I came up with 105 grand. Holy shit. Yeah, but it's all in the paperwork. It was all in the paperwork. So, you know, whatever would have happened would have happened, but it never came back on me. But, uh, yeah, he paid it off, and then he got busted, and he ended up going to prison for about 30 years. And I, I don't know who owns the house now. It doesn't really matter. But, yeah, I told that to Pat like I'm telling it to you right now, and and, and when I got all the paperwork, you know, when uh, we went through the federal system, I got all the paperwork on him. And, yeah, that's in there. And there's all kinds of shit that he said. And I was just like, God damn. I think the only thing that really bothered me is when he said I was a Midwest distributor of methamphetamine because I didn't even mess with the shit. I never sold it. I never bought any of it ever personally with my own cash. Sure, it was around. Yeah. And, I'm not, and I'm not no And I wasn't. You know, goody two shoe guy. You know, uh, I had some thrown in a can of coke on the way to Sturgis when I was a prospect. Yeah, that was the first time I ever did it. Did it freak you out when that happened? Oh yeah, it freaked me out bad, bro, bad. Because you know, I was falling asleep in the back of the pack because I wa I had watched that night at the clubhouse, so I was up all night. Yeah, I, I had I, I wasn't doing any drugs, so we left at six in the morning. We're jamming, man. We're already like. We're way in the South Dakota past Wall Drug and wherever the hell it was. And I, I'm falling asleep in the back. Somebody threw some shit in a can of Coke. I walked by and they said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to go get some uh, something to drink with some sugar or something. You know, wake me up. I don't like the Red Bull shit and all that. But I was going to just drink some soda and get some sugar in me. And uh, Pat Matter was standing there. And he, um, he said, hey, Charlie, I don't want this Coke. I just opened it, and I don't feel like drinking. I'm gonna, if you don't want it, I'm just going to throw it in the garbage. When he handed it to me, 
it was ice cold, bro. It was ice cold. When I, I took a sip of it, it was ice cold. So I knew he just opened it, you know? Yeah. I drank it. And then as I was walking away, he basically tapped me on the back and he goes, <laughs> you'll be okay now. You'll be okay. And I'm thinking, no way, man. No way did they do that. No way. Yeah, I, I just, to me, that's just not brother, brother shit to me. I would never do that. Slip it in your. It's like That's giving terrible a, to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, slipping me a roofie or something. What do you guys want to butt butt jam me or something? You know, I mean, what what else could you slip me? When so, when does it start kicking in while you're driving? Kicked in as soon as we hit the highway. As soon as we hit the highway, bro, we're jamming. I just FXR and I'm in the back jamming on a spike. I I feel it kick in, you know, and I'm kind of like, come on, let's get there, you know. And I'm like, we're in the back. I can't go fast enough. My heart's pounding. Oh, yeah, man. It woke me up like that. Wow. I didn't sleep for three days. Three days I was awake, running like an idiot all over the place. And when I shut down, oh, man, 14 hours, I laid on the bed. And, you know, I'm a prospect. I got to do shit. There's shit for me to do. Yeah. I fell asleep for 14 hours, bro. So naturally, I was in trouble again. Right? Who the fuck do you think you are? You know, you sleep whatever you want. I was like, I was trying to catch up for three days of sleep. And I didn't know I slept 14 hours. They told me that. And when I got up, I was just like, well, sorry, man. You know. So then uh, you know, they said you were supposed to watch the bikes, you were supposed to do this and that. Yeah, I, I was always on the on the shit carpet, bro. But with that being said to you. We're all in the same motel, and guess who was there at that time in 1994? Pat went out to the track because he drag raced. You know, he had a drag bike, top fuel, and he was good at it. And that, yeah. that, that was like my funnest part of the club, being in Minnesota, watching him drag, drag race. He was damn good at it, and I really, really enjoyed that because I used to drag race cars, you know? And um, I was running 10.30s, 140 miles an hour in a car, Back in the early 80s. You know, I, I very seldom saw George Christie. And it wasn't it, because George was busy. And he was always running around. And then it's funny, after we both got out of the club, we went to dinner one night and we we're sitting there. And, and he, you know, he asked me, he says, you know, does it bother you all the shit they say about us in the club? And I said, yeah, it bothers me. And bothers my integrity because I know who I am. I didn't snitch on nobody. I didn't do anything wrong. I walk with my head high. I know who I am, bro. I'm a man, you know. Hey, I got I got offered a deal, and the feds came to the prison when I was in prison, and they said they give me five thousand bucks, and they'd get me out right now. All they wanted me to do is tell them how the club operated, you know, the the inner operations, not telling like on you, but to tell how the club ran. Yeah, and if it was snitching or not snitching, I, I didn't give a shit. I I just said I don't want to do it, you know. And I ended up doing twenty nine months on a two to five. So, uh, that, that right there, you know, um, goes to show that, and I, that I know for a fact that Pat was working with those guys already because those guys were trying to set me up. This is what I was going to tell you. Those guys were always trying to set me up in the club to buy meth. And I couldn't understand why, because I, I never sold the shit. Because Pat told them I was a Midwest distributor of methamphetamine. So all these members that got busted were wearing wires on me. Oh, yeah. Three of them. Wow. And they'd be, hey, I got this pound, man. I'm telling you, I'm giving it to you for a good deal. And I said, I don't want it. I don't give a and shit. And they were all it. from Minnesota. No, no. Had. None of them. No. Pat, Pat, Pat did his little snitch thing. You know what I mean? And what he said but no, these guys, this one guy's name was uh, Mason Mike. He's a piece of shit, you know. Uh, he wore a wire on all of us, and he testified in the Laughlin trial again against the club. And um, another one was this guy named Kelly, who was from Rockford, Illinois. It, it was just a funny situation because a uh, member from Rockford got stabbed, you know got punctured in, in the lung and he's pretty bad in the ICU unit at the hospital. I went down there to see him and the cops were all freaking out because I was there because 
and figure out it was a guy taking care of business, you know. Yeah, big huge I, guy comes walking right, right. in. Yeah. And, and I and I bro, I had this uh hoodie uh hoodie on that I had, had a big death head on the stomach and over the top, and the letters over the top of it said filthy few, you know. And they're like, Oh, we know why you're here. I, I'm here to see my brother, you know. I did that. Well, when we were in a car driving, I said to Kelly, I said, uh Hey man, do you know uh do you know where that guy lives? The guy that did the sticker, and he goes, Yeah. I said, Well, pick me up tonight, you know, at the hotel about eight o'clock. And he goes, All right. And not because I, I knew he was wearing that. I believe me, if I would have known that, I would have punched his lights out right there, you know, and tore it off of him. But I didn't know that. And so I did this to him. I says, and hey, pick me up at eight o'clock and uh bring me one of these, you know. <laughs> Thank God I did that because if I would have said it verbally, I probably, you know, it would have been, been more of a conspiracy shit. But he never picked me up and nothing ever happened. So when you're in San Francisco, do you you get transferred again, right? Do you go to you no know what I to... did was it, it was so hard, honestly, God stacks. It was so hard. It's like living in New York, like I said. The the the, the price, the cost of living was so high there. I, I was struggling, bro. And then, you know, I, I told you I sold the house and I moved my wife out there. My kids were already growing up on their own. And I brought the wife out there and she, I didn't know about the nervous breakdown. And she was going through some hard times out there, too. She couldn't sleep. You know, she had like, uh, what do you call it? A sleep deprivation or whatever the hell how you say it. But at the uh, time, the whole thing with the Mongols is popping off, right? Right. And and now I was used to coming from Minnesota, the Midwest, where we were fighting with the outlaws all the time. Now it's not in California. Now it's a new it's a new crew and a new fight. Yeah. But it was weird. It was like, you know, we would um like run into each other and it wasn't no gladiator shit like what it, what it should have been, you know, like straight up just boom and rush each other like something out of Braveheart and get it on, you know, but it never was like that stack. So it was kind of more like that mean mugging and like nobody really wanted to make a move or do it. A, because trust me, there was times where I said, well, I'm going to go do it. No, oh, hey, you better not. You better not, man. And I kept saying to myself, man, why are these guys making me second guess myself? You understand what I'm saying? I'm like, well, why are you making me think, man, that I can't? You're going to get in big trouble if you do this, if you do that. I'm like, See, it reminds me of a situation. I was involved in a street gang when I was younger, right? And we had a meeting one time, and they said, there's a green light on these people. So uh, I know what that means. They, I, right. thought, I thought all of them knew what that meant. Matt. So right. the next couple of days go by, and I'm I'm with some people. And we drive by this pizza parlor, and I see one of them in the pizza parlor. So we pull the car over. We get out. I go into the pizza parlor, and I start fighting him in front of his wife, and he's with his kid. But I, we had a green light. It's like whatever. So they call a meeting the the. The next day, they call a meeting, and I'm in trouble. 